please, just a few minutes more. I'm almost finished. Will you please give this letter to the warden? It's for Mr. Finch. I will. The last mile. The last long walk to the death chamber and eternity. An eye for an eye. A life for a life. It is so written. The state which cannot give life demands a right to take life. Mary Kirk walked those 39 steps unafraid, leaving behind a letter, a document of courage. In one hour, I shall be dead, killed by the hand of the man I love. I can hear the preparations for my execution. I can feel the expectant hush through the cold walls. The time element made this case tough. I saw Fence tonight at the grotto about seven, still trying to solve the case, even at that late hour. I don't deserve so much credit. Dr. Bradford's the one you boys should feature. Well, give us a story. That's why we're here. Yeah, yeah, we no, sorry, Finch. Well, uh, this is the key that unlocked the Mary Kirk murder case. It belongs in here until it becomes Exhibit A. Something to remind me that you're never licked until you give up. I remember that case, Finch. A pistol pack and mama. Was she tough? That ace of spades was the killer's calling card in the Macomber murder. Boy, was she torrid. I thought you were falling for her, Finch. How about the little blonde who met you in the grotto tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Susie, you're a wolf in criminologist clothing. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be a psychologist. Well, boys, here's the story. Starting at the beginning. Some of you may not know that part. Well, none of us knew you were in on it until after the trial. I'll begin with the night I met Brad, Dr. Bradford. I dropped into the grotto for a drink. Bourbon and soda, please. No ice. So after all that, what could I do? I just had to accept the mink coat. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Hang one with me. You know about the bird trying to fly with one wing? Bradford's the name. Dr. Dwight Bradford. When I had friends, they call me Brad. My name's Finch. Waiter. Waiter. Two more of the same. Bob, we've had enough. I want a drink. Put that thing down and get me a drink. Office around here? No, I'm not a practicing physician. I'm doing some research. If you're lucky, doing something you like. Aren't you? Charles Finch, the criminologist. I've seen your picture in papers. I keep insisting that I'm a psychologist. And I say I'm a scientist, but I haven't proved it yet. That's not all. I've got another job. Have to. Scientists rarely make a living. But I don't talk about it. Oh, please, Bob. I wish you wouldn't. Oh, let me go. Oh, look! Got it? Okay. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Oh. Thanks very much. The two-man fire department, you do all right. As a one-woman fire, you were pretty good yourself. I'll fix that for you. Mm -hmm. There we are. Sorry to do this to your coat, Mr. Finch. Oh, that's unnecessary. Guess you'll have to come along. That's all right. <laughs> you better go back and finish your drink. <clears throat> Here. Excuse me. Good night. <laughs> the fire department's taking me home. Oh.
Come on in. We're inspecting the damage. Oh, this is my sister Susie Kirk, Mr. Finch. How'd you do? Nothing exciting like that ever happens to me. It's always Mary. Don't bother, Doctor. It's completely ruined. Susie, didn't you come in just before we did? Oh, why, no. I've been home all evening. I knew Susie was lying. I thought no more about it. In fact, the incident had been almost forgotten. When one night, I received a call from Dr. Bradford. He wanted me to meet him in his laboratory, saying there was a special reason for requesting it. Mr. Finch, I wanted to tell you some of the things I'm doing. Bourbon and soda, isn't it? And no ice? And no, and oh, no ice. Pardon. <laughs> a few months ago, the papers and magazines carried some surprising stories about the celebrated Dr. Ziegfeld, who has since died. Mm -hmm. He claimed he had revived animals after they had been dead for some time. Yes, I read about it. Now, from my own research, I'm convinced he was right. And I'm determined to carry on his work. The very essence of life, I believe, clings to cells and is held in the heart of atoms for an indefinite length of time, depending somewhat upon how we meet our end. If you could find some way to bring people back from that borderland, you'd be one of the world's great benefactors. Take, for instance, a case of death by drowning. Or electrocution. I told you I had a job I dislike, that I hate. I'm the executioner for the state. I'm the man who throws the switch to kill those condemned to die. That's uh, not what one might call a present job, but uh, in your case, I can understand it. Not only that, but I must work. It costs quite a lot to run this laboratory, and I have to have money. And I suppose you have opportunities to study those who have been legally put to death. Only with limits. Permission must be obtained. There's a lot of red tape, and properly so. This is undoubtedly an imposition, but I simply had to talk it over with someone. You're a criminologist and a psychologist. Here's to Mary. And to me. You don't mean it. My congratulations. Not so fast. What will she think when I tell her about my, my job? I don't believe any psychologist could answer that without knowing Mary better. It depends entirely upon her temperament. She might understand. Regard the matter with a complete objectivity. And she might loathe me. Finish your drink and come with me. I can't stand the suspense any longer. I want you to have dinner with us tonight at the grotto, if you will. Of course. Here's to luck. Good luck. Glad to see you again. A man named Richard was telephoning Susie, and he was so insistent that I was trying to find out where she was. Did you leave a message for her? Yes, I did. I left word where she could find me. Mary, I... Would you... Would... Would you care for a drink? I'd like a cup of coffee. Coffee. Waiter, bring the lady a cup of tea, please. I said coffee. coffee. She said coffee. <laughs> Mary, this is probably the strangest, uh, this is probably the strangest, uh, proposal? Yes, that's, that's it. Proposal? What kind of proposal? Why, uh, you know, uh, a proposal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Proposal, it's probably the strangest proposal because, I mean, it's rather, odd that uh, the guy who's going to propose invites a third party to be present at such a time. Mary, I want you to... to... Is, uh, Mary the word? Yes, it is. Yes, that's the word. I love you. Well, perhaps I better leave. No, no, no. Don't you leave. 
And there's some things about me that Mary must know. She might want to talk them over with you. Well, I have an idea. Suppose you go to the bar and finish your drink, and I'll stay here and talk to Mary. All right, I'll go to the bar. Give me a high ride ball. We're not at a high ride ball. How about a gerbil with ginger ale? Gerbil, then. Gerbil. If you could look upon Dr. Bradford merely as an instrument of the law. Oh, but surely he could get another job. If he loves me. He does love you. And we might get him another job, as you suggest. In fact, I already have an idea that might work out. But Mary, try to understand that his chief reason for holding this position is because through his prison association, he had opportunities for investigation. Oh, but I couldn't, Finch. I simply couldn't. Look, he'd be leaving me at night, and I'd wait, watching the clock, knowing that when the hour came, Brad would... Oh, I couldn't. I've got to speak to you for just a moment. Excuse me. What happened? I'll be right back. Did you tell her? Yes. What does he say? You could if you wanted to. You just won't help. Susie, I can't. Why don't you tell me who's in trouble? He's a friend of mine, and I'm... I feel I'm responsible. The one who was calling this evening? I don't know who you're talking about. Susie, I'm sorry. I haven't the money to... You would if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for what? Nothing. Your sister seems upset. Can I be of any assistance? No, thanks. Susie's always taking somebody else's troubles on her shoulders. Sit down, Mary. Well, I'm sorry, Brad. There's nothing more to be said, is there? Mr. Finch has probably told you how I feel about things. But somebody has to do it. It doesn't have to be the man I... Oh, give it up, Brad, please. I... I can't, Mary. Not yet. Take me home, Brad. Some time passed. I used to see Brad now and then. He was quite depressed, dejected. One night, we were dining together at the grotto when... But, uh, Let's get back to this letter for a moment. In a few minutes, I must answer with my life, because out of my father's past, a spectre has come back to haunt me, to provide a motive for murder. Now, in order to better understand this, we should know a little more about Mary. <laughs> I've got to find some filing space. And these papers are very old. Can't we destroy them or store them someplace? My, my, Tom Logan. I was too smart for that crook. I was appointed head of the Civic Committee to clean up the city. Picked the right man. Busted the racketeers in jig time. Logan was killed. But that was a dozen years ago. How'd you know that? The complaint's dated. Oh, of course. I thought you were too young to remember. About the age of Tom Logan's oldest girl, I should guess. And it was a younger one. Mother died when she was born. I tried to find them both, plunk them in a reform school. But some relative of the mother's took her out of the state. Two little crooks, I suppose. 
Couldn't be anything else. Blood will tell. I pride myself on the fact that everyone working for me in my bank comes from the right people. I've personally examined their backgrounds and know they can all be trusted. What about me? You're the one exception. However, Frank Ross, my oldest friend, recommended you. His word's good enough for me. You've been with me for five years. And you wouldn't be in this confidential position if you hadn't shown the right stuff. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. What about the papers? You can get rid of them. No use of clawing up things with these records. I've got a whole scrap of newspaper clippings at home. I'll take care of these the first thing in the morning. And if there's nothing more, I'll go home now. <clears throat> All right, good night. Never to come here again. I don't want Susie to know. Ah, oh, slow down. I got good news for you. I'm leaving town. I'm uh, taking up a little collection from some of my friends and uh, thought maybe you'd like to contribute. I haven't got much. You've taken almost everything. I helped everything. Tom Logan plenty when the going was rough. And that's something you wouldn't want me to tell Mr. Gregory. I think it over. Be worth a lot to you, wouldn't it, if you never saw me again? That money I've saved is for Susie. Her education. She's going to college this fall. Susie can go to work. I've got to have 500 more, and then I'll never come back. You can tell Mr. Gregory if you want everything. What happened? Mary, why did you... He says somebody named Mary done it. Get me the police, quick. I may have some news for you. Good news. It'll take a little time, but... Mary, what's happened? Oh, I was hoping I could find you here. Something dreadful's happened. Please come with me right now. You say you found the man before he died, and he said something about this girl. He said, Mary, why did you? Who was the man? Who was he, Mary? You better tell us. The police can find out. Oh, Fred. Who are you? She's my sister, Suzanne. What do you know about the man that was murdered here tonight? Was it that blackmailer? He 
His name was Willis Millen. Good. Now we're going places. Millen, huh? Millen. I know. He was a front man for Tom Logan when he was running that pinball racket. So he was blackmailing you, was he? Yes. And you stood it as long as you could, but tonight you rebelled and you hit him over the head with that statue. I didn't kill him. I wasn't even in the room. Brad, you believe me, don't you? Of course I do. Huh. We'll get your fingerprints off that statue. You'd rather expect to find her fingerprints on it, wouldn't you? This is her home. You know, every so often we bump into you, Charlie Finch. You've probably forgotten that I have a couple of witnesses who saw her hit him over the head. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to come to headquarters, Miss Kirk. Have you found any other clues? I didn't search the place. One of the boys did. He didn't find anything. This isn't one of those tough cases that depends on clues. Perhaps. In my experience is there's no such thing as a sure conviction. Not even when there's a confession. The girl claims she didn't do it. Perhaps you'll need a key to unlock a mystery before you're through, Sergeant. It'll take more than a key to get her out of jail. I had a key, all right, but a key without a door to unlock. It wasn't difficult to find out where Millen lived, but the key didn't fit his lock. Then I questioned Susie regarding her boyfriends, and she was reticent. She was more than that, she was cagey. Sometimes I thought she didn't care what happened to Mary. Then, one day, I discovered the thumbprint on the key, which matched exactly with one I had found on the statue. There were plenty of Mary's prints there, so they disregarded the only important one. Mr. Gregory, of course, will always believe that I'm guilty. He will probably witness my execution with a smile. Well, he won't have long to wait. They will come for me soon now. I went to see Gregory. Your interest in this case, Mr. Finch, is, in my opinion, entirely unwarranted. The shame and humiliation this has brought upon me is almost unbearable. I can't hold my head up again. I can understand your emotion, Mr. Gregory. But it's the girl who's going on trial for her life. Tom Logan's daughter. That's the bitter pill I have to swallow. If you could in some way help me to clear her, you'd be helping your own case at the same time. Feel? Well, being here may feel very sorry for Mary Kirk. Much more to be said. I don't blame those people at the trial. It was all against me. I lived a nightmare of days. I first met Mr. Mellon one night when my sister was out. He came to the house. Did he mention money? Yes. He supposed I knew Mary was paying him. Did you tell her about the visit? Yes. But I never mentioned I knew about the money. Robbery couldn't have been the motive. We found a large roll of bills in his pocket. If I'd known she was using an alias, that she was Tom Logan's daughter. Objection. Objection sustained. I can say what I think. Not in this court. Mr. Gregory, it is Mary Kirk Logan who is on trial, not her father. But I... You will confine your answers to the questions asked. Susie, do you believe your sister is guilty? Yes. Why do you think that? I heard Mary threaten him once, when I was in the bedroom, and she didn't know it. Then I seen her bring something down over his head, and he fell. You could identify her? You are sure it was the defendant? We went in. Yes, we know, Mr. Avery. But you mean to tell the judge and this jury that you could be sure it was the defendant? That the figures on the window shade were so distinct you couldn't be mistaken? I'm positive. I got to believe my own eyes. As 
only one thing to do, put Mary on the stand. Perhaps the sincerity will convince some of them. When I came out of the bedroom, I saw no one. He was lying there. I wanted to get help. All of my 16 years as attorney for this county, I've never tried a case so clear-cut. Everything is there. The alias under which the defendant was known, the blackmailer from out of her past, the growing desperation, the final demand, and the killing. Why should I waste your time pointing out the little things that go to prove her guilt? We've presented witnesses to the crime. This is a question of honesty. Human beings can be mistaken. Two witnesses have sworn they identified the defendant. But it is possible through the confusion of rapid action silhouetted on the window shade that they could be wrong. I put the defendant on the witness stand so you could judge her honesty. If she were dishonest, she could have claimed Millen attacked her and she struck him in self-defense. She didn't claim it because she was telling the truth. We find the defendant guilty, as charged. On the night of April 15th at 11 o'clock, I don't suppose, up to that moment, that the thought occurred to either Mary or Brad that the fates were so conspired to make him the executioner of the girl he loved. Yet fantastic, inhuman, call it what you will. Each read the thought in the other's eyes. Bradford could have refused. That is true. However, he didn't. Perhaps he hoped to bring her back to life after she'd been declared legally dead. Up to this point, there was nothing unusual as murder cases go. But a strange psychological change was taking place, as you will see. Except for Brad and me, I don't suppose there was a single person who believed her innocent. Neither did the boys who've been covering murders for years. Now, if you've been in my place and believed her innocent, what would you have done? Gone after Susie. That's exactly what I did. Susie was an interesting psychological study. Although emotionally unstable, she was not vicious. Now, mind you, when I say Susie lied, she did. But she was convinced that Mary was guilty. Why shouldn't she protect her boyfriends? They were innocent. However, there was one who wasn't innocent. But someone Susie, by no stretch of the imagination, could connect with the crime. And like many adolescents, her defense mechanism made her evasive. I know you're anxious to help your sister. Of course, but how can I help her? Someone might have killed Millen while she was in the bedroom. I suppose they could, but Mary said she didn't see or hear anyone. Someone who got in the back door, through the kitchen. One of your boyfriends, perhaps. Mr. Finch! If you forget your indignation, perhaps I can save your sister from the electric chair. What do you want to know? To start with, the first night I met you, the night that Dr. Bradford and I brought your sister home, I saw you get out of a coupe in front of your house. You told your sister you'd been home all evening. I, I was home, no matter what you think. I just went out when I heard someone honk. Who was the man? I, I don't remember. Let's see. Who was it? Oh, yes. Bill Ellsworth. That's who it was. Where can I find him? Oh, I haven't the remotest idea. He's a boy I met at a dance. Hmm. You might give him the name of all the other boys you know, but you go out with. All of them? I hope you've got plenty of paper. Well, I could believe there'd be a long list. Oh, Mr. Finch.
Good morning. Does Bill Ellsworth live here? He does when he's home, but he's been in South America for over a year. Mm. I thought so. Excuse me. There wasn't a clue in the whole list. A lot of youngsters, most of them, many of them like girls, but not even in the country. And I had caught Susie in another lie. Well, what about Millen's friends? Millen was always a cheap grafter, a coward. I tried through his friends to get a clue, but even the underworld despised him. Well, he was no friend of Tom Logan's. And while we're on the subject, Gregor was out to make a name for himself. That's why he went after Logan and his pinball machine. <laughs> to hear Gregory tell it, you'd think Mary's father was a gangster. He was running a legitimate business. To the city council banned the games. That was my chief reason for investigating Millen's friends. I hoped I might be able to hang something on Gregory. Well, as you know, there was an appeal. Motion for a new trial was denied. But anything to gain time, however, we lost. And once more, I went to see Mary. Not yet. Is there trouble in finding someone with a motive? Do you remember the night you came out of the grotto to meet Brad and me, and you were late? You said some man had been telephoning Susie. Do you recall his name? No, I don't. It was a first name. I never heard Susie mention him before. But try. Try what it was. What did he say? Well, he didn't say much. He was excited and said, tell her, tell her. Yes? I can't remember. Perhaps this will help. When Susie came into the grotto, what did she say? Did she use his name? No, all she said was that she had to have some money. And I tried to find out what it was for, but she wouldn't say. She wanted me to lend it to her. How much did she want? thousand dollars. Hmm. You and Brad were there at the time. I didn't feel I could pursue the subject. I just told her I couldn't let her have it. Someone, a man Susie knew, had to have a thousand dollars. Maybe she'll remember that. I'll come again, Mary. Call me tonight, will you? Anything new from Finch? No. He's still at it. And he's the best man in the country. It's good to have a friend like him. I wish I could help as much. If I could only do something. You've done everything anybody could. You know I love you, Mary. And you believe me, don't you? I do. Matron has come for me now, and I must close this. But I want to tell you something it will be difficult for you to believe. Incredible as it may seem, as the hour of our execution approached, Mary became resigned to the fact that Brad was the executioner for the state. To quote her, I wanted to be Brad. I know now how the women of our Western Plains must have felt when facing death at the hands of savages. By a process of reasoning, she became to regard Brad, the executioner, as but one small cog in the machinery of the law by which he was doomed to die. The jurors that voted for conviction and the judge who passed sentence were far more responsible, in her opinion. Well, she's right, but who'd expect a woman to be that logical? That brings us to tonight. Uh, at the grotto. And Susie. The usual. No ice. Yeah, just the man I want to see. Any last minute developments in the Mary Kirk case? Nothing. Seven o'clock. Yes, the execution will come off on schedule. At 11. You asked me to meet you here? Oh, yes. And you're right on time. Come on. 
Let's find a booth. Finch is still trying. I talked to that little dame and she doesn't know anything. And I mean anything. And coffee. Susie, I don't believe you are consciously sending your sister to the electric chair, but I am positive that you hold the key to the murder. If you bring that subject up again, I'll leave. You've lied to me several times. Whom are you protecting? Sit down. If you attempt to leave, I'll take you to jail for questioning. Jail? Yes, jail. Now, whom are you protecting? You're protecting someone. And I believe that that man killed Millen. I'm not protecting anyone. I've got a right to some privacy. Do you think I'd keep anything back if I thought it would save Mary's life? Let me be the judge of that. Susie, seemingly unimportant things are sometimes of the greatest importance to the trained investigator. Of course you want to save Mary. But you're working on the assumption that she's guilty. You told me that. I don't believe she is. Well, I'll tell you tomorrow everything I know. You'll see then how unimportant. Oh, please don't do that. It makes me nervous. Oh, of course. But tomorrow will be too late. I just happen to know something which doesn't concern anyone in the world, but... But who? Oh, it's someone you wouldn't know. It has nothing to do with me or you or Mary or anyone else. Better put that car key back in your pocket before you forget it. How do you know it's a car key? It would just as well be a house key. Oh, I don't know. I just supposed. <laughs> no, no message for me? No, sir. Mr. Finch hasn't telephoned. Not since early this afternoon. It was nice of him to give me hope. Nothing from... No, doctor. She didn't ask for, for someone else to take my place? No, sir. Susie, I'll let you keep your secret if you tell me the name of the man who was in the coupe. The one you said was Bill Ellsworth. I said that because it was none of your business. I never dreamed you'd check up on me. Who was it? That key belongs to the man who was in the coupe. I'm sure of it. What's his name? Ah, I remember his name. You tried to borrow money from your sister for him. His name is Richard. Oh. You wouldn't tell me because you were afraid it might involve you in some personal scandal. He was very close to you, wasn't he? Am I right? No. No. But I promise to keep you out of it, Susie. Look at it my way. Richard had a key to the back door. How did you know that? I didn't. You just told me. Oh. Needing money desperately, he got into the kitchen. He saw the roll of bills that Millen had and... He couldn't possibly have done it. I'm convinced that he did. Otherwise, how could his car key have been on your floor? Oh, how horrible. But it's too late. He's leaving town tonight. Alone? Or with somebody else? Oh, he, he wouldn't do that. Don't be too sure. Do you think we can find him, Susie? We can't. It's too late, I tell you. We can't. Come on. Let's try. Here's where he keeps his car. Is he getting away in it? Yes, that's what he said. That's his car. Good. We're in time. Where does he live? Around the corner. Ah.
key fits all right. Now there's nothing to do but wait. And pray. Pray that he comes in time. What time is it? You've got half an hour. Half an hour. Richard. Susie. What are you doing here? I just had to see you before you left. I needn't have gone if you'd got me that money. Why didn't you grab Millen's money when you had a chance? Where were you? I protected you. Now you're deserting me. You're letting my sister die. Why, you... Stand where you are. All right, out. Snell's proved to be a coward at heart. He wasn't hard to handle. He was stalling as much as I suspected. He worked at Gregory's bank and wanted to be a big shot. So he stole some money and tried to cover it up. Then he stole some more to make his first theft good and so on. Susie was flattered by his attentions and tried to get some Mary money for Mary for him. Heaven knows what reason. What really happened was... Ah, slow down. I got good news for you. I'm leaving town. I'm uh, taking up a little collection from some of my friends and uh, thought maybe you'd like to contribute. You've taken all I helped Tom every... Logan plenty when the going was tough. And that's something you wouldn't want me to tell Mr. Gregory. That money I've saved is for Susie. Her education. She's going to college this fall. Susie can go to work. I've got to have 500 more and then I'll never come back. You can tell Mr. Gregory if you want to. Everything! Mr. Millen. until Gregory hears this. Hello? Get me Governor Harrison on the phone. What? And hurry. It's a matter of life and death. Try the executive mansion. He told me he needed... Hello? Out? Well, find him. All right, we'll try there. Governor Harrison had a broadcast tonight. His wife doesn't know where he went from there. Oh, yes? Is Governor Harrison there? Left ten minutes ago. Uh, did he go home? Did he have anybody with him? Just his chauffeur. Thank you. Susie, 
Get on that telephone and keep trying. The police here will help you. Tell Mrs. Harrison who you are, and we have a confession. We are fighting against time. Get me a motorcycle escort. I'm going to try and convince that warden if I can get there in time. Oh, couldn't you telephone him? He won't listen to anybody but the governor. That's the law. But if I can see him, I might get him to delay the execution. Oh, I'll get the governor somehow. State prison. doing here, Jennings? Oh, this is it? Good. It's not a very nice place for a governor to be seen, but it's... Hush, Jennings. Nice places, as you call them, never have the kind of sandwiches I like. What can I do for you, fellas? Oh, excuse me. I just listened to you on the radio, Governor Harrison. It sure was a swell speech. Thank you. Now, could you make us a couple of Denver sandwiches? Smothered in onion. <laughs> I'll make you the best ones you ever eat. <laughs> <laughs> About time, Dr. Bradford. Yes, I, I know. Of course you know how I feel how we all feel about it. Thank you. There's always the millionth chance the governor will intervene. I'll be right by the telephone, sir. from Finch? No. And none from the governor. She's innocent, Warden. You know she is. I believe she is. It's coming to know her. But it's... We incredible. can't kill her. We can't. We have no choice. Maybe you have no choice. But I have. I'm not going to throw the switch until I hear from Finch. Think of the girl. You can't let her sit there waiting. It's torture. I can't. I can't. Pull yourself together. You're a doctor. I'm human. Listen, Warden, I thought I could. I refused to give up this job when she asked me to. This is different. I love her. I can't kill her. Law or no law? Stand aside. I'll throw the switch. No, you won't. No one will. I'll give you one more chance. If you refuse, I'll call the guards with orders to shoot. Call them. That'll give her a few more minutes. And it'll take them some time to get me. Call them! Listen to me and you'll have the scoop of the year. We've got Snell's confession. My sister's innocent. Help me! Please, please! I'll give you one last chance. Come on!
I'm glad you liked it, Governor. We are interrupting this program for an important announcement. We are trying to reach Governor Harrison. If Governor Harrison hears this, please call Warden Lewis at once. Snell, a bank teller, has confessed to the murder of Willis Millen. Mary Kirk Logan is innocent. Governor Harrison, please call Warden Lewis immediately. Just keep him here until I come out. Yes? Y yes, sir. It's the governor. Stop! Warden! The governor has stayed the execution. A bank teller by the name of Snell has confessed. The governor hasn't all the facts, but it's satisfied if so. Thank heaven, Dr. Bradford saved her. Is the governor on the wire? Yes. Release her. Hold yourself together, Brad. And bring Mary to me as soon as you have her released. The warden gave me this when I was leaving. That letter would be worth a nice piece of change to my paper. Sorry, Max. It doesn't belong to me. No, no, let's not be so solemn. It's a rare thing for the ghost elect to be able to destroy her last will and testament. <laughs> it reminds me. This letter is your appointment to the staff of the Chicago Research Foundation and Professor Michelson. Thanks for everything. Uh, well, here's to the new job, a lovely wife. My and dear friend. I prefer my toast this way. Waiter! Waiter! Put that thing down and get me a drink. Please, Bob. You've had enough. I want a drink. I think we'd better leave. This is where we came in. <laughs> you coming? No, no, I, uh, I think I'll stay. I still have my overcoat. And you never can tell. <laughs>